Pastor Paul teaching us. And he said, he was speaking about how God has an unlimited supply of joy. Say unlimited supply. God has an unlimited supply of joy, but not only that, he has an unlimited supply of all the things that we need to sustain our lives. And not only just to sustain our lives, but for us to have an abundant life, for us to have a full life. And in addition to that, he has an unlimited supply of these wonderful attributes that make him awesome. He's full of goodness. He's full of grace. He's all powerful. He sees all things. He knows all things. He has an unlimited supply of love, of forgiveness. So today we've come to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for being you. Thank you that we can approach your throne and shower you with love today. We thank you, Lord. Thank you everyone who's in this room and all the people that are online. We invite you to join us as we worship the almighty God, all powerful, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's worship him together. In the morning you sing your name And I receive your mercy Your faithfulness is clear to see It's constant every day In the morning, in the morning you sing your name
closer than a brother. He loves us so deeply that sometimes our hearts just can't even comprehend the depth of his love. Just rest in that for a second this morning. Just rest in that. Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us, you're here, right here with me. I 
Lord God, that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Cause I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. And I never want to leave. Lift it up to me. I'm not here for blessings. I'm not here for blessings. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So as we prepare to sing, 
about the cross, about Jesus' sacrifice for us. We're just going to sing and pray and really meet these words from the heart, understanding the magnitude of that sacrifice that is more than enough for our salvation. Amen.
so much, God, to give your life for us. We thank you that you are merciful and you are faithful, God. We choose to trust and believe in you, God, no matter the circumstance, no matter the outcome, because we know you are good and you are more than enough for us, Lord. We just give you praise and glory, hallelujah. As we prepare our hearts, God, to hear your word this morning, let our hearts be open, Lord, that we will hear, we will understand, and we will go forth with what you are speaking to us, dear God. We thank you for Pastor bringing forth the word and for continuing to cover and bless in God. And we just continue to lift you up. We're so grateful for this time to be together and be in your presence, Lord. You are worthy, God. We pray in the name of Jesus, that powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, welcome again to everyone here, everyone um, watching online. We're just going to direct our attention to the screens for FYI. Good morning, I'm Destiny, and thanks for visiting Oasis Christian Center. Take a look at this important announcement. Registration for the Pursuit is open right now. Visit our website to register and to get some more information. Don't let your youth miss this incredible weekend. Our registration table will also be open after Sunday service. Saturday, July 2nd, Takeover Youth will be having a car wash fundraiser. If you want to support this year's Pursuit, make sure to bring your car to be washed. Donations will be cash only. Thank you all for your faithfulness and giving. It helps us make a difference around the corner and around the world. The best way to give is online by visiting oasisnj.net and clicking the Give button. You can visit oasisnj.net for more information on everything I mentioned and more. Thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the service. All right. How are you guys doing this morning? It is a good day, a blessed day. A little different because I decided I'm throwing my chair away and I am going to get radical today and stand with my foot. So that's good. So, um, anyways, it is good. A little, little warm in here. Gosh, we were freezing in first service. I don't know what happened. It got a little warm, but uh, maybe someone can adjust it. We probably turned it down there in first service, but maybe they'll turn it back up for now. But it is a good day. Um, you know, the, back a few weeks ago, uh, we were, did four weeks on talking about prayer, the basics of prayer, talking with God. And then last Sunday, we, it was in that mode of just talking about the basics. Basics are so important because without the basics, um, it, it's kind of like the, it's the foundation that keeps everything moving, keeps everything lifted up. I mean, I know a, a pilot, uh, when they, before, and it doesn't make any difference what kind of plane they're flying, you're required to go out as the captain and walk around the plane and check everything on it. It doesn't make any difference, you know, if you've got all these other people that you, they, they can say, well, they can go do it. No, the, the captain is supposed to be the one. I know when I, years and years ago, when I was doing flight training that I didn't complete because of, my dad died and didn't get back to that. But that was one of the things they stressed so much was the fact of you've got to always check, look and make sure that everything is on the plane. As the captain, as the one, the pilot that's flying it, you have to do that. And what it is, it's the basics. It's just the basics of just checking the basic things. And they tell me, and I'm not a baseball player by no means, but um, I was talking to a guy between service, and he was telling me about how that, you know, he'd gone in, uh, up to the, the leagues and stuff, and how that, I, I guess you have to do the basics. Every, they just run the basics after each game or before a game, whatever. And I, I should be talking about something I don't know anything about, but the basics are important, amen? amen? And so that's why we were talking about the basics of prayer. Because without understanding the basics, that I'm really not going to have this walk of faith that I need to have. This relationship with God, it's not going to be as strong as it will be because I'm, I, I'm, I'm not understanding the basics of prayer. Of just as, what is prayer? It is that, in, that interwoven communication with God on a daily basis. I just weaved through my day, weaved through my life. And so last week we started talking, I started talking about the faith-filled living. 
And I really want to take the same approach, the basics of faith-filled living, just coming back to the basics. Last week, we talked about the aspect of having the uh, perspectives, the, how we view our life, the purpose, uh, purpose in life, and, and your role in God's plan for your life, that God does have a plan for your life. Amen? That he has a plan he wants to work in and through your life and, and how that we need to learn to see through the eyes of faith. You know, to move past our past. The enemy loves to get you stuck in your past and your disappointments or failures, your frustrations or your, you know, the, the, the things that have hurt you, the things that have wounded you. We all have them. We all have those stuff. So I, I mean, I've been wounded. I've been offended. I've been, I've been, I've been and been. You've been, we've all been, okay? But, and so the enemy loves to hold us there. And so when I understand that, that if I'm supposed to walk this walk of faith, it's going to require me to step out, to move out, to really take the time to step forward and really see God move in a greater way in my life or to work through my life, to move past my past and realize that, that God's grace and mercy is sufficient to cover my past. Amen? I don't have to keep worrying about it. I, I run into people every now and then that have been a believer for a long time. 20, 30 years, and, and the comments, Pastor, I just, I, I, could you pray for me? And I just think this is something that they're dealing with right now, but, you know, it's something that happened back 20 years ago, but they're still dealing with it and struggling with it, and I always come back and try to remind them, listen, if you gave that to God, he's not, he, you're the only one that is holding you there. You're the only one that's reminding you of that, whatever that was. And you and the enemy. Satan loves to remind you. But you're buying into the lie. You got to move past that. You got to move forward and, and into today, into the future, and let that reflect God's favor and his blessing upon your life and all that you do. So, talked about some of those things last week. So, today I want to look at another major part of our faithful life. And that comes down to the aspect of faith involving the words that we speak, the words that we speak to ourselves and the words that we speak to our situations and the circumstances that we go through. And I'm just telling you again, very basic. So, you know, if you're there, oh, this, I've heard this before. Good, we always need to hear it again and again. I don't know about you, but I need to hear the things over and over again. Because there's times that I've been, listen, I've been pastoring a long time. I've been a, a Christian for a very long time. Uh, honestly, I think I've, I don't know how, how long I've been a believer, you know? It's been so long. I mean, it was, I grew up in, I grew up in a, a pastor's home. We were in church all the time. When I say all the time, we were in church all the time because we had a lot of meetings and stuff back then. My dad, he pastored church, two churches in South Carolina. He, he'd preach at one and then have to go drive to another one across town and, and uh, there were two small churches that he pastored. So I was, we were in church all the time. And, and I always remember in, in, in numerous times they were, you know, having an altar call, me accepting Jesus, you know, and I'd already accepted him before, and I just went through the flow. So I've been saved a number of times already. Hallelujah. Amen. I think I'm good to go. And uh, anyways, I'm, I'm busting around with that. But the point is this, is like, no matter how long you've been in church or how long that you call yourself a Christian, we need to always refresh our mind and our heart with the basics of this walk in Christ. And so today we're going to talk about that. And Jesus, he, he talks about the power and the weight of our words. So let me just preface it with this. We're talking about words and the power of those. So, so I'm, I'm not talking about some new age positive, or whether positive thinking or name it, that's not, name it, claim it thing. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the power of God's words working in your life. When we speak God's word, when we, we, we say what God says about the situation, when we deal with the challenges that we deal with in our life and use God's words, and I'm going to give you scripture about them and take that scripture, walk in it and run with it because, you know, there's always scriptures that people take and twist and go all different directions. And my goal is for you today is just Let's, say, let's see what Jesus said. Let's walk in that and how we walk in it in our life. Amen? So let's just dive right in. So Jesus is talking about the power and the weight of words. You know, words can be weighty. Think about that. How, you know, you can say, and it's amazing, you can say something one way, but the way that you say it also has a lot of power to it, right? You can say, oh, I love you, and smile, really genuinely mean it. Or you be like, yeah, I love you. Of course I love you. Which one do you want to hear? You want to hear the nice one, right? You know? They're both saying words, but it's the power of what's adding to the words. What we don't realize sometimes is the words that we say, just that, I mean, nonchalantly or just kind of throw it out there or whatever, but that, that there's power in those words. So let's get to the scripture. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 says this. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account of every careless word they speak. Let, 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 me, rewind. let me read that one more time. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give 
account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The Phillips translation says it this way, For it is your words that will acquit you, and your words that will condemn you. I don't know about you, but that sounds like, that's pretty weighty words. <laughs> that I'm going to give an account? Like, I don't know, I really don't know how that works. I don't know how that really plays out when we get to heaven. I guess it's, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of things that you say, well, why, what does that mean? I don't know. All I know is what it, what we, what it says. There's a lot of things, because it's like this, the whole thing is not about everything. It's about God's love for you and how he's bringing Jesus, you know, to get you into this relationship with him and all these things. So there's a lot of stuff we don't know that we'll find out when we get to heaven. Amen? If you make it. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Somebody was waiting on that, okay? <laughs> so, Julie, I think you already knew where I was going with that. But anyways, but no, seriously. But the point is this. So I don't, I don't know if there's like this line. I, I, I kind of picture if that's the case, it's going to be a really long line. You know, I hope it's like the grocery store. When you go to the grocery store, there's like the people that bought the whole store out, you know? And then there's like the 15-item line, okay? I want to be in the 15-item line. I want to get my life so straightened out that I make sure that, that I'm really dealing with this stuff, okay? So like I said, I don't know how it works out. I'm just kind of playing around with that, but there's power in words. You know, I, I never un understood when Christians read this passage and then go out and gossip and lie and complain about other people and think it's not a big deal. I'm, I'm grateful for my mom and dad. Not, they weren't perfect, but they were very big on this in the aspect of what we said and you know that's where that kind of helped me within within our house Leslie and I made it very clear there's certain words that you are not allowed to speak in our house and like for our kids you know, I told you the other day that hate was one of those words that we were not none of us you know we had time out there's sometimes I just wanted to say hate so I could get a time out and everybody could leave me alone <laughs> um, <laughs> but I still had to understand I can't say hate but there's a reason because of that. Those words have power. And I think we need to be more conscious of our words. I mean, Jesus is very clear about talking about the power and the weight of words. And, and, and when we just read something and just haphazardly go by and think that, oh, well, whatever, everybody else does it. The reality, not everybody else does do that. And some people do understand the power of words. And we need to understand, as, as Jesus followers, we need to understand the power of words. Like, for example, the word thank you. It's one of those words that we use all the time. We, hopefully you do, and hopefully you do say thank you. But it's also one of those words that we kind of just, we just say it, right? You don't, because it's, it's the nice, it's, a, it's the polite thing to say. You say thank you, right? But we sometimes don't really, sometimes don't really give the, sometimes it is a very heartfelt thing because you're so grateful for what they're doing. But I guess what I'm saying is that we use it as a reactive word more than an active word. In other words, we're reactive to you do something, somebody does something, oh, thank you, as opposed to an active word where I'm actively saying this out of a heart of generosity. Now think about this. If we, if we made it a point to really understand the word thank you and the aspect of gratitude, to release the power of gratitude in our life, to really grasp gratitude and that everything in our life will change. The perspective, how we value things change. If we make it a point, I know myself, I've really worked to try to do that in my own life is not just to say a haphazard thank you, but to take a moment to stop and think, to really say thank you that I'm really meaning out of a heartfelt thank you. But see, it requires us to stop because it's so easy. We'll just kind of throw words out there. Don't think about it. But when we really take the time to stop and say, hey, I am really grateful for this and put heart into that thank you. And I know this sounds like maybe I'm just playing on words or something like that, but I'm really not. Because what I've noticed, because I've really made a conscious effort to do that because it's so easy to fall into just the rhythm. I'm not saying I get it right every time. But what I am saying is that if we take, and I'm just talking this as an example, it's not what I'm talking about, but just kind of, we all say thank you, all do it. But what if we just paused, it may be mental pause in our mind that we, before we say those words out of our mouth, that we really understand that we are really grateful for that, really thankful for that. That what it does, it gives us a heart of gratitude. We see things in a different way. We have a perspective in a different way about how that we value what we do as of just flippantly throwing a word out there that we just really take the, the grasp, the, the, the greatness of gratitude in our life. So the power of words. So n anyway, so let's, let's talk about it. We're going to dive right into this. So number one, the first two of the two things we want to talk about is that the words that you speak to yourself, the words that you speak to yourself. There's a term that is used 
that um, you can search it. You'll get tons of things on the internet and things like that about it, some good, some kind of out there, but it's called self-talk. It's that, it's that we do it all day long. It's that ongoing um, monologue, sometimes encouraging, most of the time critical and negative, that tells you, like, that was really stupid. Why'd you do that? Well, wow, you really look dumb the way you're dressed right now. And, you know, and all the things that we kind of roll through are like, oh, you shouldn't have said that. Now they really think you're a fool. You know what I'm saying? We, we had this, this dialogue, and they say literally um, that, that the normal speech pattern that we have is 100 to 150 words a minute. I think I kind of go on the other end, a little higher end, because I have a short period of time and I got a lot to say. And so I just get, my mom used to always say, Fred, slow down. So anyways, I tried, but it doesn't work. But self-talk, this is crazy. When I look this up, anywhere between 800 to over 1,400 words a minute, your mind is telling you things. This self-talk, this, this monologue is running through and we're choosing what we're going to take and what we don't take. Now, when I was looking at that, thinking about that, I was like, well, isn't that crazy? But you think, well, that's not really a spiritual thing, but you know, I think it should be because Satan can totally use that to rob your faith, to keep you from what he wants to do in your life, from keep you, keeping you from moving forward because if he can use fear and despondency and, and self-esteem issues, all these things to hold you back. I mean, you are paralyzed and crippled and you're not moving forward. You're not taking a step in the, in the next direction it's because if I'm just buying in and listening to all this and, and so it's a matter of understanding what's going on there. This self-generated dump truck of words that just gets dropped in our lives, they're getting to be self-empowering or self-defeating and it really is our choice to make. And I know there's a few of you saying, well, okay, this sounds like a lot of psychobabble. Is this really biblical? I'm glad you asked that because yes, King David dealt with the same exact thing. So let's check out what David did. David's enemies had all banded together and they're like seeking to, to take his life from him. Now, I don't know about you. If you have a bunch of people that had decided to ruin your life and you hear about it, it's gonna stress you out a little bit, right? And I know some of you have been at work, you've had people in your job maybe, something like that, that don't like you and they maybe lied about you or said things to get about you to make you look bad or stupid in front of other people or try to get your job. I mean, this is kind of the same thing. You're, you're, you're worried about it, you're worried about your job, you're stressed out. You're, if you know what I'm talking about, th this is where David is. But David's situation is they want to take his life. And so David comes in in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, it says this, but David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. So wait a second. So David is got all these people that are tr that are banding together to try to kill him, try to dethrone him, and David stops for a moment in the stress and the distress and all the things that are there. He stops for a moment and says, "Wait a second. I need to get my mind in the right direction." I'm sure his mind was on overflow. Sometimes we 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 forget that the people that we read about in the Bible are just people like you and I. We think they get some superhuman connection to God. They got a little red phone in the back, like the bat phone or something like that. They can just call up and talk to God. They think that, you know, they had it all together, that they were superhuman. No, no, they were people like you and I. They, they, they had struggles. They had frustrations. They got scared. They dealt with fear. They dealt with stress. They dealt with good, bad, indifferent, all those things. And so here you, you had this situation here where he's like really fending for his, his kingdom, for his life, his family, all that. And so David understands the importance of changing the narrative. And he says this, it says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Another time where David says, you know, says something to himself is Psalm 42, verse five. He says, so he has a conversation with his soul. He says, so then my soul, why would you be depressed? He's not talking to people. He, can you imagine like maybe the people in the other room that kind of helping David, like, you know, his, his king. And they're like, who's he talking to? Oh, he's talking to himself again. <laughs> But he, but he is, he's having a conversation. He says, why, are you, why would you sink in despair? Just keep hoping and waiting on God, your Savior, for no matter what, I will sing with praise for you are my, my saving grace. So you think about this, he, he's saying that whatever the situation is, he is depressed, he's in despair, he's down. And he, so he, he, to combat that, he says, hey, just keep hoping. Just keep waiting on God, your Savior. No matter what, I make a decision. I'm going to sing God's praises. No matter what, I'm going to declare that he is my refuge. He is the one I run to, that he's got me. He's going to see me through. Amen. See, what he's doing, he, yes, he's speaking to himself. He's encouraging himself. He's saying, I'm going to do this. I got this. Not I got this, but God's got this. 
But see, if, he, if we buy into, if he buy into that, the despair, man, he's just sinking lower and lower. But he understands. I love David's life. You look at David from a young boy, shepherd boy, all the way up to, you know, at the end, in all his mistakes, he made, he made some pretty bad mistakes. He always gets, comes back running back to God. He knows where to come back. But he has this relationship because of, because of the worship. He's always, you know, it's like David loves to worship. David loves to be connected to God. And in that, he knows this relationship. He, he has this connection with God that he understands that, God, you're with me. Even when I mess it all up, you're with me. And even when I'm in despair, you're with me. And this is what he's saying. He's reminding himself. He's telling himself, hey, stop de- being depressed. Stop getting all worried. Start hoping in God. I'm going to wait on God. I'm going to declare God. I'm going to sing praises with praise over. I'm going to sing with praise for you are my saving grace. And what he's doing, he's pulling himself out of the, the nosedive that his life was taking. I'm sure it didn't change the situations immediately, but it changed him. And when you change that, it gives that. See, now, now faith can arise. Now strength and now hope and, and God's power and presence is going to arise to enable him to move forward because now any doubts he may have had about God coming to his rescue has just gone out the window because he knows that he knows that he knows, God, you're my hope. You're the one I'm waiting on. You're going to see me through in this. So I can buy into the thing that's constantly beating me down or I can come back and begin to walk and step out in faith and trust in God. See, he's talking to himself and he repeats the same exact thing in Psalm 43. He also says in Psalms 103, verse 1 and 2, he says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. I love that fact. How many times do we forget what God has done? See, David is reaching back. I've, I've talked about this before. He's reaching back to everything that God has ever done in his past as growing up as a young boy all the way to the point that he is right here. And he's saying, hey, I refuse to forget what God has done for me. Because we do. It's so easy. We look around, well, God, look what God did over there. What about that person, that person? Oh, yeah, they gave their testimony today, and God did this. They got a job, they got a car, they got a wife, and they got, all, they got everything all wanted. Blah, 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 blah. What about me over here? Nothing, nothing. I get nothing. <laughs> so uh, we could go so many directions to that. I'm just going to stop. But anyways, funny directions. But no, no, it's like, what happens when we do that we're so busy looking at all this and all we we're running the, we're listening to that self-talk and saying well oh, you know God doesn't love you like he loves them maybe God doesn't really like you at all yeah you know what I don't think he does because remember what you did way back then how could he ever love you why would he ever want to do something for you oh you're nothing so when that happens, all of a sudden you're shrinking, you're stepping back from God. Man, the enemy wants to tell you anything he can. He wants to separate you from your relationship with God and he'll use whatever he can to do it. And that's why David is declaring the fact, God, you are with me. You have not forgotten me. You're going to lead me and guide me through everything that I deal with. So David took control of the self-talk by going through his mind he, he, that was going through his mind and he told it what it needed to hear. You need to know God is still on the throne. God is still on, in, in, in charge. God is still going to see me through. God, I think I'm declaring your word. So you know why? Because there's going to be some times that there's going to be nobody around you encouraging you. Can I just tell you that? There's going to be some times. You know, you, you're just smiling your way through it and everybody thinks everything's fine, but you're crumbling inside. And you're just saying, God, just you know, send somebody my way. But they don't know because you look like you have it all together. Because we all play that really good sometimes. How are you? Oh, good. Bless, 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 bless. I don't know. Just some kind of whatever to add to it. But you're not. You're something's really seriously crashing in your life. And sometimes you reach out and there's nobody there. So what do you do in that case? That's where you have to understand that there's not always going to be someone encouraging you, and Satan's always going to work to knock you down. So you know what? You need to begin to speak to that discouragement and speak to that defeat and speak to the fear and all the feelings that are trying to pull you down, saying all those things. You need to speak the word of God to encourage yourself, to build yourself up. You know, in athletes, athletes when they, it's, it's known, one of the studies I read, that it's known that it, they, they'll take and they'll just encourage themselves before they go out on the playing field kind of psych themselves up and, and they go out there and they play better but what if you think if you just added that to the fact of you and I just going through life if we really took the time to encourage ourselves with what God says about us 
what his word says, remind ourselves of what God has done in our life and all those scenarios and come to that point and really continue to move forward, how much more the power of God's word working and operating ourselves would really break those things through in our life. You know, like David spoke to this soul. He's speaking to himself. He's speaking God's word. Like Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. God, whatever you call me to do, I thank you. I'm going to make this through. You know how many times I've used that scripture over, over the, all my years of pastoring? Because there's so many times I wanted to quit. Lots and lots of times I wanted to quit. Lots of times, there's a few times it was like, looked pretty good, some good offers. Thank God I didn't take them because they, they were really bad. When I looked at them later in hindsight, but my mind's telling me, oh, no, you, that's better. You should, you should just grab a hold of that. You should just go. You know, they have palm trees. That's even better. Okay? I like palm trees. I don't like snow. New Jersey doesn't have palm trees or snow, so... I mean, they have snow. They have palm trees. Or sand, I meant. Yeah, they have sand, but not the same sand. Anyways. But see, what happens is when, when, when we are allowing ourselves to, to speak God's word, and when, when it's difficult, when it's tough, I can do all things through Christ because you're strengthening me. First John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm declaring God's word. Nehemiah 8, 10. When you don't feel like you have any joy at all, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. So I declare today, I know what I have to deal with, but you know what? My joy is not going to be built upon what good is in my life or what's good going to happen today. What's good's going to my joy is bigger than that. It's higher than that. My joy is in the Lord. So the joy of the Lord, that's my strength. So it may not, I may not get it this way, but I'm going to get it heavenly this way. God, it's going to rise away. It's going to give me the faith. See, those faith-filled words, walking in, that, that, in the faith, the fact of knowing that God, that I'm, my, my joy is not depend upon if everybody smiles at me, if I get this, if I get that, or this happens, or it happens, God, I'm going to plug it into you because that gives me a joy that can supersede all the stuff around me. That I can still move forward and smile and still be okay even if things aren't going so great today because your strength has enabled me to get through this to where things really are in a better spot. Amen? So, Romans 8, 37, it says, through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I am more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. Just that, that, you know, it doesn't mean I just get by, but God, you're going to complete the work. It's gonna be, I'm going to be on the other side of conquering this. More than a conqueror. See, all through the day, declaring God's word in your life, speaking God's word, what does he say in your life? When you need it and when you think you don't need it. And I, I, I try to make it a point in my life to do that because when, when if, if not, because you, you never know what the hurdle you're going to have to jug, juggle or jump over. There's a, actually been a, an audio book. I, I prefer audio books over sitting reading books and sleeping halfway through the book. So anyways, I'm not a huge reader, but I do listen to a lot of audio books. And so there's one I'm listening to. And I just want to throw it out there as a, as a, as a great resource. Uh, I think it kind of lines up with this. It's a Christian author, but he's not writing to a Christian audience, if you know what that means. So if you read it and you listen to it, whatever, and you're like, but he didn't mention any scripture. Pastor, rah, 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 stop gossiping because you're not supposed to be doing all that. I'm telling you right now, he's a Christian guy, but he's, his, his audience is to business and all over the place. So he can't quote scripture in those capacities, but he's, he's, a, he's a strong believer. So he's good. His name is John Acuff, um, A-C-U-F-F. The book is called soundtracks. It's about the soundtracks that run through mind. Very similar to what we're talking about here. A little bit different, but it may be a good help. I've enjoyed listening to it and just throwing it out there for you guys. So, and he's not going to send me any royalties, unfortunately, but I think, it's, I think it'll be a help for you. So, anyways. Second thing is this. The words that you speak to your situation. The words you speak to your situation. What are the, the situation that we're going through? The, the, you know, the, the circumstance. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, listen to the truth I speak to you. Whoever says to the mountain with great faith and does not doubt mountain be lifted up and thrown into the midst of the sea and believes that what he says will happen it will be done so i mean i've heard lots of different messages on this and some people have taken and twisted the thing all around and turned it around but it's still the fact is that jesus is saying when you're standing in front of a mountain in your life that looks like you are surrounded it may be the rocky mountains it may be the andes mountains it may be the watchong mountains which are very small but the fact is this is that whatever the mountains are in your life that God's word is bigger than whatever that mountain may be. And when I begin to speak God's word in that situation, he can move that mountain. When what you say is based on the word of God and you're fully engaged in your faith, mountains do move. I gotta be full. That's a, that's a faithful life. Be fully engaged. Mountains will move. So, as I said, some of us have whatever mountains in our life, but 
Maybe it's a mountain of fear. Maybe it's a mountain of panic or maybe discouragement or frustration or despair. But maybe everything's just upside down in your life. Maybe little things are upside down in your life. But God did not give you a spirit of fear. So you've got to say to this mountain, every, once, every ounce of faith that you can muster up, be removed in Jesus' name. I will not be controlled by the fear. I've been given a spirit of power, of love, and sound mind, and this is not going to rule my life. That I'm moving forward and pressing forward. And that's, see, that's building the faith up in my life. Jesus said to speak to the mountain directly. You speak to the mountain. You say what God has already said about you in a, in a situation. You speak God's word in the circumstance. Now, perfect example of this, 1 Samuel 17, a teenage boy by the name of David. Is, 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 he's a shepherd boy. His father's asked him to leave to go deliver some food to his brothers that are in the Valley of Elah. And they're there. His brothers are there fighting a battle with the Philistine army. So David, he's not there. He's, 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 a, he's a scrawny little, I don't know, 12-year-old, 13-year-old. We have no idea. I don't know how old he is here. He's just a, a teenage boy. And so now he's taking lunch to his, his big brothers, okay? And he gets there, but David is different in one sense because he's got this relationship with God just by hanging out with God and spending time with him. And so, out as a shepherd. And so he comes up to where the battle is and, and he hears Goliath, who is the, the opposing army's uh, warrior, and he says, give me a man and let us fight each other. And so David looks around and he sees all his brothers included. All the other soldiers around are completely paralyzed with fear. No one's going out there to fight. And so David says, you know what? I'm going to do this. So David steps up. He has to try to convince the king that, you know, I can do this. And, you know, he's a, he's a little kid. I mean, that looks like, I mean, you know, so what's the king going to do? Going to send this little teenager out there with all these mighty men of valor and warrior that are hanging out in the, you know, hiding out here in the tents over here that are afraid to go fight. Ultimately, he does go out there. He steps on the battlefield with his slingshot. He's got five smooth stones. You know how the story ends. You know Goliath comes down. But what is the big part that really makes the difference here? The big part is what happens right before that, and that is in chapter 17, verse 45. It says, David said to the Philistine, what do you say to your mountain? David is a shepherd boy. He's not a seasoned warrior. Goliath is. Goliath is huge. He is a champion. He's wearing armor. He has a javelin. He has a, he has a shield. He's got a sword. He's got all the stuff that he comes in. And David's walking out there with his little slingshot. I mean, it just kind of looks really stupid, doesn't it, when you think about it? But I want you to put yourself in the position of where you are with the things that you're dealing with in life to look bigger than where you are, than who you are right now. David shouldn't be on this battlefield. In fact, all the other guys behind him should be on the battlefield. They're all playing chicken in the tents, afraid. Oh, I don't want to go see Goliath. Okay, so we send the little scrawny teenager out there. There we go. That's, that's really, that's a good thing. And so even Goliath is like insulted that like they send David out. They're like, are you kidding? He's like, are you kidding me? This is what you send to me? And so he says, he comes in, and so David steps out there, but there's something that rises up in David's life. There's this faith that's in this young boy. As he, I mean, I'm sure he was like any teenager boy bringing lunch, being an errand boy for not really, I mean, maybe he liked it because he was getting out of having to watch the sheep, but at the same time, do you think he really wants it? He's probably like biting on the sandwiches, kind of stealing, so I don't, who knows what he's doing, but he, he's, he's just like any other kid that's just going to deliver stuff. It's, he's not going there to fight anybody. But when he hears this mockery that, that, that Goliath is giving, something rises up inside of him. When he steps on the battlefield, it's like all of a sudden, the faith that he's had in God all this time has just suddenly been like morphed into something so much bigger than himself. Just filled and consumed with this faith that God, even in this, you can take care of me. Yeah, you took care of me from the, saved me from the lion and, and the bear when I was out there watching the sheep. God, and all of a sudden, it's like something just kind of clicks in his head that, wait a second, if God took care of me by, from, and saved me from those guys trying to steal the sheep, and you know what? They're like pretty big themselves. What's, this guy's no different. So you know what? I'm going to do this. God, you got this. And he says to him, he says, he says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. What is David? Slingshot, five stones. I mean... Come on, if you, I don't bet, but if, you, if you're betting, hello, who are you putting the odds on? You're definitely voting Goliath in this one. Hello. That's like the, you know, mega million right there, okay? At least everybody thinks it is. He says, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. See, the fact was he's, he's not even putting his faith in the slingshot. 
He knows he's got the ability of the slingshot, but what is he putting his faith in? He's putting his faith in, in something that Goliath cannot see. And this is what happens to us with so many times when we step up and we're faced with things that we look at and we're like, I am not sufficient to be able to fight this. I don't know what to do in this. I don't see how I'm going to get through this, how I'm going to win this battle in my life. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your financial situation. Maybe it's that mountain of debt that you look at and you think there's no way I'm ever going to pay this off. Maybe it's a business that's falling under. Maybe it's just life itself. David steps up there and he's looking at the situation. He says, you know, he's acknowledging it's not even the slingshot that I have in my hand. He says, you know what? He goes, I come to you against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the Israel, uh, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. The, the, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. So what has he been now? Now he's stepping into faith. First, he's acknowledging where this faith is coming from. This faith is not something that I mustered up. This is something because it's, it's God Almighty. He's the one that's got this. He's the one that's in control of this situation. Because you know why? It's, it's that acknowledgement because see, you and I, we walk to our battles with a slingshot. And we're like, how am I going to ever deal with this? How am I going to win this? It's not up to you and your little slingshot. It's up to the God that you serve. It's up to who you follow. It's about where your faith is plugged into. And this is where David steps in there and he's, you know, he's acknowledging, it's not this little slingshot here because my faith is not in sword or shield or javelin or spear and all these kind of things. He says, but today, you know what's gonna happen today, Goliath? Today, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'm gonna strike you down. I'm gonna cut off your head. This day, the Old Testament can be a little gory at times, but this very day, I will give the carcasses or the bodies of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is is a God in Israel. You know what? You're standing before things in your life that you look at like this is impossible. You know what? You've got to remember it's not you. It's not your strength. It's where's your faith connect? What are you plugged into? Where's your power coming from? He continues. He says, all those gathered here will know that it is not by, by sword or spear for the Lord's, uh, that the Lord saves. So he says, th those things that we think that we have to fight our battles with is none of those things. He says, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. That's how you speak to a giant. That's how you speak to something that looks impossible in your life. It may seem a little strange talking to your mountains and talking to your Goliaths and talking your problems and situations, but it's, it's about confrontation. It's the willingness to meet your challenge head on, not avoiding them, not denying their existence. Because David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's why he was able to walk out and do that. The, David spoke boldly to Goliath before the battle even started. Jesus told his followers to speak directly to the mountain. Why is all that important? Because your words have the power to ignite your faith. And everything that David did and everything he said before, when he walks out there, man, it's not David, it's not little boy David, little teenage David anymore. It's faith-filled David because he understands that his, that his power is not his power, but it is God's power working through his life. And his words had the power to ignite the faith in his life. Like Paul said in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When I hear God's word, when I'm speaking God's word in my life, it ignites faith in my life against whatever it is or for the situation or for the circumstance. When you hear the word of God proclaimed, when it's spoken out loud, your faith comes alive in your spirit. Something inside of you. It's not flesh and bone. It's what's inside of you. It's the power of God. It's the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. It's the spirit of God arising inside of you of faith to go in the situation that you can proclaim God's word in every situation. Romans 10, 9 and 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you can profess your faith and are saved. The, the thing that brings you in a relationship with God, it's as confessing Jesus Christ, Lord of your life, it says it's, with, it's when you believe in your heart. It's the faith that arises inside of you that literally transforms your life and determines where you spend eternity. You know, it's like whether you're gonna spend it with God or separated from God. My mom, she was funny because she always had all these little sayings all the time. And she, I remember she said, Frederick, I didn't you know, I always got the Frederick when I was in trouble. So, so I want to tell you, hell's hot. <laughs> I didn't need any more description from that. I don't want to be there, okay? If hell's that hot and it's hotter than summer, I don't want to be in hell, okay? That was pretty much said at all right there, okay? <laughs> that inspired faith right there, amen? Anyways, your words matter. Speak God's word in every situation that you face. You know, and your faith will come alive. And you will see his power at work in your life. So, you know, I, I need to begin. You need to begin. Begin with the words that you speak to yourself. 
Remind yourself of what God has said about you, that he will finish the work that he has started in your life. Let me just say, if you're wondering when it's ever going to be completed, when you take your last breath. It's a lifelong thing. We are a work that is constantly in motion. He's constantly working in us. You know, and thank God for that, because you know why? At the, you know, 21-year-old Fred is a lot different than, than the Fred today. And I'm grateful for those changes. You know, I thought I knew a lot back then. Well, I didn't think I knew that that much, but I knew what I knew. But I looked back, I was like, wow, Fred, back then, 21-year-old Fred, you didn't really know hardly anything back then. But see, if I kept thinking like a 21-year-old Fred's mindset, I would be some arrogant guy right now but acting like a 21-year-old. And if you're 21, nothing against you, but you don't know it all yet. There's a lot more you're going to learn. You're going to be a much bigger and greater person than you are right now. But you can't do it living in a 21-year-old mindset. you got to grow. you got to change. you got to allow your life to grow. Let God continue the work in your life. See, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll give you the power that you need to overcome any temptation. He'll give you the strength that you need to persevere through every dark time. But see, I need to proclaim that in my life because the devil's going to tell you the complete opposite, that this is never going to change. You're always going to be like this. You're always going to have this temptation. But no, I'm declaring God's word. I need to remind myself until the truth of God's word takes root inside of me and begins to rise up. And by your words, your faith comes alive and or are you going to surrender to fear? To fear? I'm either going to let the faith come arrive, alive and lead me, or I'm going to allow fear to cripple my life. But I need to go back to the basics. Let me give you a quick little story, and I know I'm a little over, but be done in a minute, but most all of you know the, the Life Training Center, the LTC, we refer to it as over there. We have, you know, all kind of different classes and offices there, all the different things in that building. And for me, like, talking about the fact of, of the words that we speak. And so before we had that, that was a law firm. It's been there very, it's an old building. It was first built in the seven, part of it. It's like the mid-1700s and the mid-1800s and then early 1900s, the last addition to that building. So it's been there for a long time. Well, when I was a young teenage guy, about 14, 15, I guess, somewhere 13, between 13 and 15, um, I used to make money by there. I cut the grass, and it was, it was all different kind of things. It was a wine company. It was a law firm, all different stuff. And, um, and it was a residence and stuff. But anyways, I used to cut the grass when it was this, um, this wine company, German wine company was there, and I'd clean their windows. And I kind of shared this story a long time ago, but I remember one of the days I was walking in, I was in there cleaning the windows because they, they smoked so much that, that literally you couldn't, the, the, the windows were so fogged up from the nicotine on the windows. And so they'd have me come in about twice a year and I clean all the windows and it was like, I'm scraping the, 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 the soot off the windows. It was so bad. I remember the one, but the, the floor between the first floor and the second floor is a window that kind of looks out over here. And, and as a, I don't know, a 14, 15 year old kid, you don't think about the fact that, you're not think, I wasn't thinking about the church having a property and stuff like that. And I'm just, right now, I'm just trying to clean these windows, all this nicotine off these windows and stuff like that and, and make the money, you know? And looking out there, and I remember when I looked out there, and it was like this, 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 this thought came to me as I'm looking out there, and I said, wow, this, is a, this would be a great property for the church one day. And I just went on doing my own thing. When we actually acquired that building, I was standing in the same thing. I think they were actually pulling the carpet off, uh, I think Rosalind. I think Rosalind was one of the ones that was there. There were a few people that were pulling carpet off of the, the stairs that needed to come out. And after we had bought, bought it, it was ours. And I'm standing, kind of, I had to stand in front of this window to kind of get away from what they were doing. And I looked out the window and it's like I flashed back to like that 15 year old kid and that seed that God had planted in my mind way back then, and something I didn't even think anything about came back to me, that this property would be good for the church one day. And here we're standing in it. Today, we're ripping the carpet out to put new carpet in. We're painting the walls and opening up the doors and doing things that were gonna happen for us to be able to have a greater aspect of ministry. And what's so great about that building, that was the building that we didn't plan, because originally what happened was that we were trying to, we were trying to build a building to add on to here because we were out of room. We didn't have that building. We didn't have, you know, if you think about us here with nothing over there, it, it, it's difficult because we do a lot of things in that building over there and have over the years that we've, that we've had it. And so, and I remember we were doing that and, 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 we, and we were already we were excited about it, but you got to do all this like discovery before and find out all this stuff. And then you take everything to the city and take it all to the state. And we get there and the city's like, oh, no, you need all this, this, this. And we take it to the state and the state's like, well, you're not dumping all those people on the street like that. After that, we had to pay for someone to sit out front and count cars for hours to go by. 
And they're like, no, you need another exit. And there was no other exit because we didn't own that property over there. So they took and they like squashed all the plans that we had. And I mean, it was devastating because we'd raised money. We had people get mad, leave the church. Well, you know, you said you're going to build a building. I can't fight the state. The state said no. They wanted us to buy a $260,000 light out here. And then maybe they would consider about us being able to do it, to have a light here so we get out. I don't know about you, but a, buying a traffic light for $260,000 is not what we want to spend the money for. So we were, we were like broken. What do we do now? And so that building came into our mind. I remember Wilfred and I, Wilfred Llewellyn and I went over there, met with one of the guys, the law, at that time it was, it was a law firm at that point, and talked to the guys and said, hey, if you ever decide to sell this, please let us know. We, we really need to expand. We'd love to buy this because the city won't, the state won't let us we need, prop, we need more property to do anything. And so the, the state's holding us back from being able to expand. And so we need to expand. So we'd love to get that. And they're, okay, whatever. We didn't realize they were going into foreclosure. Long story short, they went into foreclosure, went to the bank thing, back and forth the bank, put an offer to the bank. It was like a 750000 or something like that dollar, somewhere in that ballpark. It, uh, you know, what they were offering for it. And it was like, wow. So we counter offered them. We went back and forth. And this went on for a couple of years. It was so frustrating because nothing was happening. They put a sign out front. We were in contract, put a sign out there. And then for sale, my mom was like, we need to go down there and chop that sign down. I was like, mom, you're going to get us arrested. You got a little wild thing, you know? I was like, I'm not going to go, to, I'm not going to go break that for sale sign down. That was a big for sale sign too. You can just imagine an 80 year old lady out there, chop, 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 chopping the sign down. She goes, they're not going to get that. This is for the church. And so, and she was believing that. And so during that time, what, what, I, what we did, because I, I, you know what, this is, you know, this is my mom, this is my, my dad, this is how they were. When the God spoke something, they, they're determined it's going to happen. So I started parking over there. We, we didn't have the driveway to go through. There was no, there was a garage they had where the driveway breaks into that property. It was totally different. There were no sidewalks over there because we didn't do anything over there. It wasn't our property. And so I'd go in there and I'd park every Sunday and every Wednesday. And so, and my kids used to complain all the time. When they were younger, and they were like, Dad, in the snow, in the rain, we had to walk through the grass coming over here. There was no sidewalks. It was, you know, it was just a mess. And I would, sometimes I would bring other, another pair of shoes because I always get, if it was like raining or snowing, I'd get my shoes I was going to speak in messy, so I'd have two pairs of shoes. And we did that for years, back and forth. And every time I walked across there, I said, Father, I thank you. We put offers in this. We've, we've done everything that we can do to get this building. I thank you that you're going to give us favor with this, with this bank. The bank is going to stop playing around with this stuff. It's going to let us have this property. And I just claim it in the name of Jesus. And I'm walking over this. This is, this is Oasis' property. That, that no one else is going to buy it. Yeah, they can stick a sign out there, but no one else is going to buy it. They can go out of contract and ignore us for months, but no one's going to buy it because no one wants it because it belongs to Oasis. It's not happening. They're not taking it. It's, not, it's our property. And so we did that for years over and over. And man, it was just forever. And you know what? And then, you know, they, the, our attorney had said to us, and he, he said to me, he says, hey, Fred, he says, listen, he's, he's a Jewish guy. I've known him for a long time. And so he knows I'm a pastor and stuff like that. He said, listen, you know, he says, you know, he's a good, you know, he's a good lawyer and nice guy. And he said to me, but look, I, I don't know. Yeah. And he knows, I, he, he said, you pray whatever you want to do. But he goes, I, I just, banks just, they, they're just going to ignore this. They're just going to go into foreclosure. They're going to write it off and the whole thing. I'm like, okay, but I think I have a different idea. And so, and Chris and I were in Chicago. I think it was in Chicago. We were in it for a meeting. And my phone, uh, I got a phone call and I looked down and it was him. And so I said, hey, I'll be right back. So I, went, I, got, out of the, I got out of the building, meeting, went in the back and uh, we're in the foyer or whatever, the, the church. And, and, uh, and he, says, he says, Fred, you're never going to believe this. And inside me was like, oh, yes. <laughs> This has been years of fighting this and speaking God's word and declaring that God has given. Now, listen, we weren't, nobody owned that. We didn't go over to someone's yard and say, oh yeah, we, we, in Jesus' name, we want your house and I'm taking your car and I'm taking all this stuff. That's not what I'm saying. We didn't do that, okay? We were in and out of contract so many times it was ridiculous and the bank was ignoring us. And we started speaking God's word that God, you've given this to us. And he says, I don't understand this. Okay, because he's the one that told me this will never happen. He said, I don't understand what's going on with this. I don't understand why, all this stuff like that. He goes, but they want to know, because it had some remediation soil issues and stuff too. He says, if, you'll, if, if you, the church, if you'll just sign off and the church will just take it, they can have it for $10. $750,000, somewhere $700,000, $800,000 building, whatever it was, I don't exactly remember, but if we would take it for $10. And I said to, I said to Larry, I said, um... Yeah, I think we'll take it. I think we'll take it. So, and so that building is the blessing that we didn't even know we needed. So, 
As you speak God's word, mountains get moved. God's no respecter of persons. I don't know what your mountain is, but I know this. God is no respecter of persons. He will open the doors that you never dreamt would be possible. Let me pray that you guys get out of here. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you that you challenge us. Father, I just know that you just, that there's people here today, you're planting them this in their life so that they begin to lift their faith up, begin to speak your word into their life, begin to speak your word into their business, begin to speak through their, your word in the work of their hands. Father, knowing that you're leading, you're directing them, that you're letting them know that you are with them and all the lies and all the thoughts that Satan would throw in our minds to try to discourage us, that we're gonna move past it like David. We're gonna step on the battlefield and we know we got that, those, those rocks in, our, in, our, in the pouch, we've got the slingshot, but we know that the real victory here is you, God, and you're gonna clear the way. You're gonna make the difference in this. So we speak your word. We walk in faith faith-filled as we move forward in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Well, <clears throat> if you need prayer, our team would love to pray with you. Otherwise, have an amazing week. We're going to pick up another subject. Same idea. We're going to stay in the same series. We'll see you next week. God bless.